as our understanding of autism increases, awareness spreads, and that has led to an increase in autistic diagnosis. Perhaps you're watching this video because you've started to realize that something seems a bit different about you and the way that you think, and you're wondering if you might have autism. In this video, I'm gonna share five common signs you might be autistic. At the end, I'm gonna include a bonus sign that is rarely ever talked about. This sign will blow your mind. It's also by far the most important sign, in my opinion. Before I start with sign number one, I wanna share with you something important. I was diagnosed with autism at the age of 41. The only reason I went to a psychiatrist to inquire about autism was because of the research I had done on ASD symptoms. Actually, the research my wife had done on ASD symptoms. I checked a lot of the ASD symptom boxes, so I went for a diagnosis. My intention for making this video is not for you to self-diagnose, but to give you a launching pad with which to carry out your own research, which could lead to a diagnosis from a psychiatrist, or in some cases, a licensed psychologist, or just to give you a better understanding of how autism can look for someone like me. Also, keep in mind that autism is a spectrum, and although autistics tend to share a collection of symptoms, how those symptoms look differs for each individual. In other words, no two autistic brains are the same. On to sign number one. You have a really hard time with unplanned interruptions or surprises. Now this sign actually encompasses a lot and can manifest itself in a variety of ways. So I'm gonna break it down by sharing some examples of what I mean by unplanned interruptions or surprises, because it's probably not what you think. For this first example, I'll share a personal story. A little while back, I was on my way out to meet up with a good friend. The meeting was scheduled several days ago and it was at a spot I felt relatively comfortable with. Honestly, I was pretty excited and maybe a tad bit nervous because I hadn't socialized in a while. Even though I was a bit nervous, I left my apartment with a huge smile on my face. On the way to the meetup, I turned on some 80s classics and as I was bouncing my head to the music, I started to think about the things that I talk about with my buddy. I actually laughed out loud a few times, thinking about the fun stories I'd get to share with him and how his face would look after I told him. There wasn't much traffic, so I got to that cafe right on time. Parking was a breeze. I got out of my car feeling shockingly relaxed and confident. This meetup is going to be way better than I ever thought it would. And to think I was actually ready to cancel it last minute. Wouldn't that have been a huge mistake? As I entered the cafe, I spotted something that changed everything. I did another quick look to make sure my eyes weren't playing tricks on me, but they weren't. My worst nightmare had just become a reality. My heart immediately stopped beating. I couldn't move my legs and it got really, really hard to breathe. My entire neck and jaw muscles clenched so tightly they locked up. And then my body kicked into overdrive. My heart started pounding. Boom, 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 boom. My body suddenly got extremely hot and I started to sweat. My face started burning. I wanted to turn around and drive back home so I could hide in my bed, but I didn't. I kept walking to the table where my friend was sitting. And as I sat down at the table, he introduced me to his new girlfriend. It's not that my buddy had a new girlfriend that bothered me so much. It's how dare he invite someone else to this meetup without letting me know ahead of time. But I hid all those feelings and kept it together for my friend, knowing that the whole meetup is going to go entirely different than I had planned. I spent the next two hours worried constantly about what I was saying and how my facial expressions looked and whether I was making enough eye contact. The drive home was miserable. After I got home, I played the entire meetup in my mind over and over again for the next week, wondering about all the spots where I messed up and whether or not my buddy was upset with me or whether or not his girlfriend liked me. But this all happened because an unplanned surprise guest was at the outing and I didn't have a chance to mentally prepare for it. For the next example, I'm at home. Home is my safe spot. It's a place I can be fully myself and all of my things are exactly where they are supposed to be and the temperature is perfect. Suddenly, the doorbell rings unexpectedly, making me jump and my heart race, and quite possibly making me think I might be going into cardiac arrest. Do I answer the door? Do I hide and pretend no one is home? Do I turn off all of the lights? For a lot of people, a doorbell ringing is no big deal. But for an autistic, when someone encroaches on your home unannounced, whether it be a friend or family or a postman, your body may go into fight or flight response because of the suddenness. You might get highly irritated and possibly even really, really angry. You might find that your muscles get really, really tight and your head feels like it wants to explode. It could throw off the next hour of your life or possibly even throw off your entire day. 
For the third example, I'm sitting on my couch reading a book when my phone suddenly rings. I check the number to see who it might be, but who am I kidding? I'm not gonna answer that phone call regardless of who's calling. Why? Because it's unexpected and I wasn't prepared for it. So I sheepishly put my phone down and pretend it was never ringing. And this kind of scenario doesn't just happen every once in a while. <laughs> Heck no, it's the standard. And why shouldn't it be? I don't like talking on the phone much anyway, but I rarely, if ever, answer a call if I'm not prepared for it. So autistic people generally do not like it when we experience unplanned interruptions or surprises because it hurts a lot, physically, mentally, and emotionally. And it sucks. So let's move on to sign number two. If you're autistic, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about with this one. Sign number two is you hate small talk. Small talk is a devastating experience that really bothers us autistics for a variety of reasons. First, we don't understand how long it's supposed to last. One sentence each, two, more? How long of a pause do you need before it's my turn to talk? It's almost always unplanned. We don't usually like things that are unplanned. Unplanned things hurt and suck. If you don't remember why, go back to watch number one. Small talk is kind of like lying for us too. Like when someone asks, how are you? You're supposed to respond with, fine. But what if you're not fine? And if you're autistic and in the middle of a small talk giddy up, you're probably not fine. You aren't allowed to be honest. I've tried this and it didn't work out well. And I'm not sure why, but me and many other autistic people I've talked to have a very difficult time lying. The other thing with small talk is you need to fake interest in what the other person is saying. Even if you have no interest at all in the weather, the traffic, or the pajama set they bought their stupid three-year-old chihuahua for Christmas. You have to stay there and engage or risk being labeled a giant jerk. This is a challenging situation because listening to small talk makes my head hurt and my neck and my shoulders and my butt. And honestly, I don't want to have to listen to anything at any point if it's going to make my butt hurt. All right, two signs down onto the third. This one is really interesting to me because it's one of the things that I think makes being autistic special. When I'm feeling a little bummed about being autistic after a hard day, I just think about this next sign and I feel a whole lot better. So it is sign number three, special interests. For an autistic, special interests are more than just interest. I'd say they're closer to a mild obsession. And I think this is actually a wonderful thing. There's a few reasons why I connect autistic special interests to being an obsession. First, it's all you want to talk about. I mean, it might actually be all you want to talk about. Here's a quick unofficial test you can do if you're wondering if you might have an autistic special interest. Try approaching a non-autistic person and start talking about your special interest. Avoid masking. Just freely talk about your special interest. Notice the facial expression of the non-autistic person five minutes into your conversation. It'll be one of utter boredom, shock, or quite possibly disgust. Why? Because most non-autistic people aren't nearly as passionate about a topic. They rarely ever want to talk about something, or anything for that matter, day in and day out. In addition to wanting to talk about our special interests all the time, autistics spend lots of time thinking about it. Possibly the first thing when you wake up, while you're going to work, while you're at work, while you're coming home from work, while you're eating, while you're showering, you get the idea. Autistic people will do a really deep dive into it. Sometimes we're so into it, we forget to eat or drink. We even forget that there's other people in existence. And when we're in it, we really don't like interruptions and definitely don't like unplanned surprises or interruptions. If you don't remember why, go back to number one. Another interesting point worth mentioning here is that special interests are as varied as we all are. Not all autistics like the same thing. We're far too unique for that. So some of my special interests have included sharks, Still love them so much. A little bit afraid of them. Actually, utterly terrified of them. Also, orchards, which Debbie talks about a few times as being one she didn't really get for a while, but it didn't matter to me. Designs of spaces, absolutely love design and seeing other people's designs. Castles, boxing, music, especially classical Baroque era music and jazz music. And there's a lot of others but I've already heard other autistic people talk about their interests, like espresso machines, wind turbines, Legos, crocheting and knitting and sewing, tattoos, the process of embalming bodies before burial, I'm serious, certain sports like basketball or soccer or yoga, and much, much more. The vast range of interests that autistic people deep dive into and constantly think about 
basically during all waking hours, is really special and unique, but also something you might not even know about if you don't get to know some of the awesome autistic people out there. So if you're not autistic, just know that some of your friends might have interests like this. And if they share them with you, that's pretty special. And for autistic folks, embrace this, but also realize not everyone will immediately understand how awesome it is, but it's still awesome. Sign number four is talked about quite a lot, but there's one component that gets missed pretty frequently. And when I learned about it, so many things I did started to make more sense. And this also connects to the bonus sign I'll talk about at the end. So it is sign number four, sensitivity to sensory stimuli. Just because certain sounds, smells, or textures bother you doesn't automatically mean you're autistic. Autistics can be very put off by certain sensory stimuli, like lights that don't bother other people, but it's probing through your head or makes your ears ring or makes you feel nauseous. Slight annoyance for non-autistic people can be anger inducing or even make an autistic person feel physically ill. Things like textures, temperatures, smells, like tires, hair salons, hospitals, sunlight. This one might seem odd, but sunlight can be very overwhelming. For me, the brightness can hurt my brain and I can't turn it off or turn it down. I'm not sure if it's just me, but it makes me sneeze a lot when it's really bright or when I first step out into the sunlight. That actually reminds me of a really embarrassing story I don't wanna share with you. But uh, since I just brought it up, I think I'm gonna have to share it with you. I was leaving my apartment and I went out of the building and went outside. And immediately as I got outside, the sun punched me in the face. It was overwhelming. And I started to sneeze because that's what I do when the sun punches me in the face. That's fine because people sneeze, I'm used to sneezing. The problem is I also had some gastro issues, a little bit of bloating and a whole lot of gas. So what ended up happening after the third sneeze is I could no longer clench my butt cheeks tight enough to keep it from exploding into the world around me. And I started farting with every sneeze. These bad boys were loud. They were louder than the sneezes. So a little bit awkward, but I think where it got really painfully embarrassing for me is when I turned around and saw that there was an entire middle school class and all of their teachers right behind me. Yeah, they were just out for a little stroll. Perfect timing. Great, thank you. Sounds can be horrible if they're too loud or piercing, but also because sound receives equal attention in our brains. In other words, we can't block certain sounds out. For me, this is true all the time, and it's incredibly annoying. Sounds all seem to get equal attention in my brain. This can be really overwhelming at times and exhaust me. If I'm in a restaurant, for example, I might hear clanging of dishes, scraping forks on people's plates, conversations, sudden laughter, background music, phones ringing, toilets flushing, registers making dingy noises, and all of this is boogie-woogieing in my brain while I'm expected to listen to whoever is talking to me. If I'm at work, this can also be frustrating. Someone is talking to me, but there are kids in the hallways chattering, and a song is playing in a classroom, and someone is knocking on a door. These might be fun sounds, and I like hearing them all because it's great seeing a vibrant place of learning, but it's also hard for me to focus on the conversation because there's so many other sounds happening just within the space I'm in. Don't even get me started on the places where the sounds and the combination of other sensory stimuli are really overwhelming, like movie theaters or malls. But if you wanna know more about those, I'll add some links below to my other videos of places that suck for my autistic brain. Now, one fact that also is generally overshadowed by the negatives of being sensitive to sensory stimuli is the positive feelings that can also happen, like how I'm attracted to certain smells. I love lilac and devilwood. Devilwood. The smells are so soothing, and I'll seek them out. I will stop and stay in the place to smell them. When I'm smelling devilwood, I can't even hear other things around me because I'm lost in the smell. It floods my entire brain and my whole body. It's really wonderful and honestly hard to describe. For a non-autistic person, they might like the smell, but they won't experience the smell. They won't stop whatever they're doing for a while and just smell. No, they'll probably just continue on with their day and forget the smell a short while later. Forget the smell of devilwood? What? You must be joking. That smell will stay with me for hours and hours and hours. 
Some smells can also really calm me down, which I like. The other point that I think is really interesting here is that many autistics are really sensory curious. For example, I think about jumping into a pool full of jello just to see what it's like. I'm very curious with physical sensation. Okay, so side number five is talked about a lot, but there's another side that isn't talked about nearly as much, and I don't know why. It's very common for us autistics and makes interactions with non-autistic people pretty interesting, but also at times pretty frustrating and confusing. So what is sign number five? Eye contact and understanding facial expressions. Either not good at reading them or hypersensitive to them. So if a human face is made up of 100 puzzle pieces, most autistics will look at a face and see only one or two pieces. In other words, we aren't looking at your entire face and seeing the complete package. That's not how we look at people. If when you are in a conversation and immediately notice that the person you're talking to has those spit lines, you know what I'm talking about, in the, in the right corner of their mouth, you know what I'm talking about. But it's not as simple as noticing that thing. And I'm not even judging that thing about the person. It's all the thinking that comes next. Should I tell them that they have spit on their lower lip? Is it going to go away on its own? Do I have that when I talk like that? How would you make sure not to have that on your lip, even if you knew? I might notice that one thing and I can't stop fixating on it to the point where I miss large chunks of what the person talking to me is saying. Eye contact is a tricky one. Just because you're autistic doesn't mean you can't make eye contact, nor does it mean all eye contact is uncomfortable. But for autistics, eye contact usually is uncomfortable, especially if it involves someone you aren't very familiar or close with. Why autistic people often prefer to avoid eye contact is still being researched, but one new study from Yale sheds more light on the matter. In this study, they analyzed brain activity during brief social interactions between pairs of adults, each including a typical participant and one with ASD, using a non-invasive optical neuroimaging method. I'm not even totally sure what that all means. But basically, both participants were fitted with super complex headgear loaded with sensors that emitted light into the brain and also recorded changes in light signals with information about brain activity during face gazing and eye-to-eye -eye contact. When individuals looked at a face on a screen or TV, there was similar activity in the dorsal parietal cortex. When individuals were asked to look at real people's faces and make eye contact, non-autistic people had increased activity in the dorsal parietal cortex, but people with ASD did not. There's a lot more if you want to read the study for yourself, but basically it's not as simple as saying that eye contact is difficult for autistic people. Autistic brains are actually wired differently than non-autistic brains. And that means we do things differently and for different reasons. What we do during eye contact sends different signals to different parts of the brain than for non-autistic people, which makes our reactions and the conscious and unconscious decision on whether to make eye contact significantly different too. So yes, making eye contact and understanding facial expressions is different for people on the autism spectrum, but it doesn't mean we can't do it. But it also doesn't mean we necessarily always should be expected to or are choosing not to because we're being rude. Those are all judgments made by other people. So if making eye contact or understanding facial expressions is challenging for you at times, this could be a sign that you're autistic. But just because you can make eye contact doesn't mean that you aren't autistic either. All right, here's the bonus sign. And I've included this one because I feel it's really, really important to know. The bonus sign is a lot of unexplained medical conditions. You need to be your own doctor. And I don't say this because I'm advocating that you self-diagnose yourself or try to prescribe yourself medicine or something wild like that. What I mean is that sometimes doctors will make you feel like you're crazy. You'll go to them for answers. And some of them, not all of them, but some can make you feel like your symptoms are all in your head because they can't individually figure out what's going on. So they kind of write you off or say, well, I can't actually find anything medically wrong with you while giving you this sideways look that makes you feel like a kid who just got caught telling his parents that you saw Santa Claus sneaking down the chimney. Do not let this deter you. From my experiences and other autistic people I've talked with, doctors rarely work together, even within the same hospital. So the combination of medical issues you experience often goes unnoticed. These ongoing medical issues you might be facing will become chronic issues and can be very dangerous if left untreated. It is extremely important you figure these issues out as they could be tied to autism. But I, for one, had no idea over the many years and dozens of specialists I've met with until my autism diagnosis. Some of the medical issues I faced and still face are 
gastral issues, muscle pains, headaches, skin issues, lung problems, coughing, itching, spasms and twitching, tinnitus, sleep issues, bladder issues, and anxiety and depression. So there you have it, folks. Five signs and the bonus that you might be autistic. Any other signs that I missed that you think I should have included in this video? Let me know in the comments section. Autistic people will do a really deep dive into it.